My name is Keith Wilson. I am the Research and Development Director here at IDFL Laboratories. IDFL originally stood for the International Down Feather Laboratory and has been founded since 1978. Uh, IDFL has been a key partner within all of the industry associations around the world for almost 40 years. IDFB is actually the International Down and Feather Bureau that is an umbrella organization for each one of the individual country associations like the Down Association of Canada, the American Down and Feather Council, EDFA, which actually has member, uh, many, many European and non-European uh, member, member states, as well as the Japanese Down and Feather Association, the Taiwanese Feather and Exporter, Exporters Association, and the Chinese Down and Feather Industrial Association. IDFL serves as a key technical laboratory in each one of these different capacities and we look forward to actually seeing you at any of our laboratories in the near future. Today I wanted to actually offer a quick little presentation about the story of down which is basically a cradle to grave uh, scenario and also the down QA, also a down QA crash course. Uh, so what our objectives are going to be is basically starting off with the overview of the down, down and feather supply chain so you understand where the actual attributes of the quality are coming from. Uh, second of all, we wanted to connect the quality attributes with the actual supply chain processes. Uh, so in order to kind of get into this, we're going to go break this into two different presentations. The first off is a uh, presentation on the story of down, going through the farm, the slaughterhouse, the down processing, manufacturing of finished goods. And then we're going to move into a second presentation, which is actually the down testing overview, which actually includes physical attributes, uh, cleanliness attributes, and also other quality attributes. So to begin with, uh, obviously everything, all waterfowl begins with, or all down product actually begins with waterfowl, which is generally goose or duck. Although there are very many different species of goose and duck, all of the, the down and feather of the, of the world today is actually sourced, be, being sourced from uh, domesticated species, actually is actually listed right here. Looking directly at the macro supply chain, we're going to go through the, we have the producer, which is basically the farmer, the slaughterhouse, the down processor, the manufacturer, the retailer, and the consumer. Um, as down and feather material goes throughout the supply chain, it is imported and exported. It is flown and um, transported all around the world for many multiple different purposes to in order to kind of fulfill consumer needs. So starting off beginning of the, uh, the life of the bird. Obviously, the, the egg is the first step, and then after that, the eggs are hatched and turned into and uh, become chicklets. Then we have the uh, the different types of plumage. As the bird as the bird develops throughout its life, it has like different types of cycle. It has different molting stages. The first molt is sometimes considered uh, a little bit lower lower uh, quality of down. As you get into the uh, the older birds. Uh, that's when you're going to get a little bit better down, just for the fact that the that the material is actually a lot more a lot more mature. Moving along here, there's different types of attributes, although there's not a ton of research that's available regarding about the impact of the diet toward towards the down and feather material. Um, it is always understood by most manufacturers and producers that the the diet, as well as the species, the genus, the the environment that the bird is actually raised in, all actually have a a, a minor impact on the quality of the down. Each one of the different species can actually have different little uh, different little attributes and different quality attributes whether how many how many barbs are actually on a cluster or how fluffy it is or how resilient the material is the size of the cluster all this different type of stuff actually determines the, the overall quality of the down and feather material. At the very end generally it's the you have the goose and the gander or the duck and the drake and then you have the offspring which is basically being slaughtered these types of generally the um, the birds can that you know the 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 breeding stock can actually last anywhere from like 10 to 25 years depending upon the particular breed and the uh, the treatment of the animal throughout its life at the very end of the life however the uh, or the the offspring is going to go through the slaughter process and there's a, sl a sli slight little process kind of outlined here Moving along, after the slaughter, there's obviously the major reason that the that the ducks and the geese are actually raised is for the meat. Um, ducks and geese uh, is duck and geese meat is found all around the world. Uh, there's also a lot of quill feathers, and there's you know used for like knocks on the on, on, on arrows. Uh, the down and feather industry is also a big part of that, and also a lot of other byproducts such as the the residue from down uh, materials. Sometimes the residue can actually be used for fertilizer and other byproducts. 
Um, generally, from like one bird, one goose in particular, you can get about 300 grams of plumules of down. This is actually broken down into 60 grams for the wing and tail feathers, 90 grams for the small feathers and down, and then 150 grams for the total feathers and down. Moving along, this is basically where the industry, the, the meat industry, and the down industry separates itself to this is really the beginning of the, the, of the down and feathers and then the end of the, the bird and the uh, meat process. Generally, the, the, da the down will actually be pre-rinsed at, uh, at a slaughterhouse and then it'll actually move being sold over to a final uh, down processor. And I wanted to kind of go through the down processing uh, portion. So first off, you actually start off here at the be very beginning with the incoming raw materials. The material is then separated, the down from the feathers and the other materials. And then the down is actually washed and cleansed and the feather is washed and cleansed. And it's brought back together in the, in the appropriate uh, requirements for blend for making an 80% jacket or a 90% goose down jacket. So the, each one of the different materials are actually put together in a separate, separately. And then you have the storage and shipment process. And I'm going to go through this just a little bit more in depth. Uh, first off, at the very beginning, you have the plumage, the plumage de-duster. Very much similar to like you sweep before you mop, you're always going to want to dry clean before you wet clean. Uh, it's a lot more uh, green, it's a lot more efficient. Um, but basically what you can actually see here in our diagram that the de-dusting, or the material is actually unveiled from the material when it is actually coming from the slaughterhouse. Then it goes through the de-dusting machine. And basically these are little sieves that can actually separate uh, they can actually separate the material. It's just basically kind of like go in a rotating cylinder and all of the material is actually kind of uh, falls out the very bottom of that. And then that's actually sucked out and then actually put into, the, as you can see, like the vacuum chamber and the dust and impurities are actually bagged. Um, after the de-duster, then we're going to go on to the plumage washer. And this is actually like the mopping, like I just explained. So you're basically going to take the material and you're basically going to go through and wash it. This type of machine is very similar to what you actually see with your home wa clothes washer or clothes dryer. Um, there are little holes that allow the water to kind of come in, allow the water to evacuate. Although this particular, this particular apparatus actually has two portions. You have the, the portion that's actually washing it, and then it goes, it's being dumped out into a centrifuge where it is, is spun very quickly, and all of the water uh, is, is evacuated that way. After the plumage washer, we're going to go on to the plumage sterilization and drying process. After the material has been washed and, and semi, um, all of the, the excess water has been evacuated through the centrifuge on the previous slide, um, then it's going to be going through a steam dryer and a cooling chamber. Um, and through this process, the sterilization process is always done at 120 degrees centigrade for 30, 30 minutes. This makes sure that any type of material is 100% clean from uh, mold, bacteria, viruses, any type of any type of um, uh, bacteria or anything of that nature. So it goes through that, and that's actually a regulated process to make sure it's a very clean material. Going through the next process here, you have the plumage separator. The plumage separator um, includes basically a series of chambers you can actually see diagrammed here, and basically you have the, the loading silo dumps the material into the first chamber, and then by, by weight and also agitators and also air gusts, you can see that the material actually makes it to, the, the down material makes it to the very last chamber. So in the very last chamber, you might have a composition somewhere around maybe like 90, 10, uh, whereas in the first chamber, you might actually have something more like maybe 50% feathers and 50% down. So as you go through each one of the different chambers, you're going to get more and more down and less and less feathers because the feathers are a little bit heavier and they don't fly as high. So as they're going through these chambers, then the, the feathers and the down are naturally separated. This is actually a key, comp the key component of the composition process of the, the down and feathers. As you can see, oh, there's also a suction fan that's actually also pulling out a whole bunch of different impurities. Uh, different types of dust, um, little maybe little big, little bits and pieces of dirt or anything of that nature. The very last process is actually the bagging system, where they actually the bag from each one of these different uh, these different chambers of the of the, the plumage uh, separator process. Then each one of these has actually has an evacuation process, where the material is actually kind of uh, deposited into a bagging process. At the beginning, at the end of the bagging process, then you can also see the material is uh, is is wrapped up into a uh, into a bag that is very similar, like you can actually see right here. Now, um, 
going along after the material has been separated if I'm actually a client and I actually want an 80-20 material I might actually take some 90-10 and some 70-30 and actually mix it together make an 80-20 generally through the separation process a, a skilled manufacturer can get the get the accuracy of maybe like plus or minus two to three percent so if I'm actually looking for an 80 percent I might actually have a 75-25 and an 85-25. That's a 10% difference, or 5% plus or minus 5% difference. But uh, through the mixing process, if I know I have 72% uh, material, or excuse me, 78% material and 82% uh, material, I can blend that together within almost 1% of, of the final composition. So you can actually see right here a finished, uh, finished lot of plumage that has been washed, cleaned, and separated and blended back together as it as has been as it is required. The blending process is a is a process of actually blending all of the different materials, whether it's duck or goose or down or feathers, and blending that back into a process in order to kind of meet your final requirement. A standard American blend of 80/20 material is going to have about five different components in it. You can see right here that the um, that the goose is actually accounts for about 90% of the material. Duck is about 10% of the material. Now you can also see that there, the 80-20 is actually indicative of the percentage of, uh, of actual down. And then the other 20% is going to be comprised of feather, feather fiber, broken and damaged feathers, maybe uh, residue and other different types of components, including the landfowl. So when you're looking at an 80-20%, it's broken down into five different components. So once again, at the very end of the at the very begin at the very end of the uh, of the washing and the separate the separation washing and blending process, you're going to see the finished product right here, which is actually the finished plumal the finished plumage that has been washed, separated, then blended back according to whatever the specification or the labeling require, requirement is for that particular lot or order of down. After this process, then basically the down can actually be imported or exported all over the world. Um, the down, uh, down and feathers are going from Europe to Asia, Asia to Europe, uh, um, back and forth between the Americas. There's a lot of down that may, goes around the, around the world. And this is basically by compressing maybe four or five bags of down, then you're not working with such, a, such, a, such an excessive fee when you're going to be working with shipping. But after the sterilization process, maybe the down is going to be staying in a maybe in a storage facility. Here in this particular process, you can see right here that the um, you can see right here that this is made in different bags of down. Whereas these bells over here, these have actually been multiple bags that have been compressed together and they'd be ready for shipping. Um, there's a lot of down that actually, particularly in Shaoshan, China, there's a lot of down manufacturers, and down and feather material can actually be shipped between each one of the different manufacturers, and it's a, it's a very uh, convenient process to make sure that the down is um, uh, every order of every manufacturer is 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 made. Um, the next process is this is actually the completion of actually the down processing portion. From here, we're going to go into a little bit of the general textile manufacturing process where the down is being going to be inserted into shells and it becomes a finished product. As you can see right here at the very beginning, you have uh, the receiving of the materials where a lot of quality assurance processes are actually done. Then this is where the design process comes in. Then the textile comes in, it, uh, the, the scheduled textile is being come in, imported into the factory. Um, and also the down is actually being brought into there and then it's actually all brought together in a finished piece and then the finished products are actually shipped and then warehoused and, and then it goes on to the retail and the consumer use. So what we want to start off here is with the bedding products. I've separated here the bedding products from the outdoor products just because there is a little bit of a deviation in the general process. The general idea is the same however there is a little bit difference between the um, there is a little bit of difference, obviously, between the different products. Uh, first off, right here, you can actually see the construction of the bedding shell. The shell is actually the shells for bedding products are generally made out of cotton, um, a very maybe a very simple weave, 233 thread count, um, just a general nice breathable uh, quilt to in order to actually make that very um, very comfortable when, when sleeping. So as soon as the, generally the, the just the chambers are going to be made with this, just one vertical chamber, and then the down is actually inserted into the 
into the material. If it's a pillow, it's very simple. You just you make the pillow, and then you actually kind of use this particular uh, filling machine right here on the right of the slide. And then the the quilts are usually entered in. You know, they go into maybe a, a different type of a filling machine, as you can see right here on the on the slide as well. As soon as it actually is inserted, and then the the down is actually um, evened out. Um, you can actually see that there's different machines that come back and actually put the cross the cross weave into this. So you end up with the the initial we the initial channels going this way, and then them being going back and forth and being um, uh, completed in the the horizontal fashion. Afterwards, then the the factory might go do a little bit of quality assurance, making sure that the down uh, is equally distributed throughout the uh, throughout the quilt, making sure there's not any cold spots, there's not any overfilled or underfilled chambers. Um, after that, then the material is actually boxed up and, sh and be ready for shipping out. Um, the next process I want to kind of go through is here is actually the outdoor products. Outdoor products, once again, are just a little bit different than the uh, than the bedding materials. But what I wanted to show you here really quick is generally through the uh, throughout the process, you know, an order will actually be received, the size and the the the, the um, specifications for each one of the pieces of fabric is going to be cut. And then these pieces are going to be digitally um, drawn up on a computer, and then each one of these different um, each one of these different pieces is going to be cut out and actually being used for this gentleman here with the cutting device. And then he's going to go through and actually kind of cut each one of the individual pieces according to the specification. Um, you can see right here he might actually be cut, cutting maybe five or six hundred pieces all in one in one process. You can see right here that the fabric is all laid out and then multiple pieces. Um, it's all laid out very uh, very systematically and then the and then the cutter kind of comes through and cuts that out. Um, then the shell goes through a, a typical assembly line process. You can see right here that they, you know they begin with actually maybe like one person putting on together two pieces and then it moves on and the third piece is actually added on then the fourth piece and all the way at the very end you'll actually have uh, a shell that is ba that is ready to be filled with down. With the jackets, you know, a very similar process, but uh, is where the material is going to be inserted into the product. The you will, you will see right here. This is a typical apparel shell filling, and you'll notice on this that with the jackets, or with even with the bedding products, that a very important product or in, a very important aspect is making sure that the material is is making sure that the material is filled properly. If you're ordering. Uh, a a jacket that's being filled with 200 grams of down, you want to be making sure that you get the, the actual 200 grams of down. Um, and then you can actually see this on indicated here with the the, the a little um, weight chamber here that is actually mod it goes through and allocates that amount. Next of all, then the materials is you know either like the down bag for a jacket is going to be inserted into the rest of the jacket or the di the different pieces, the front panel, the front left panel, the front right panel, the back, and each one of the arms are going to be attached. Each one of these is going to be seamed together, and then the products are um, inspected. Maybe additional pieces put on, like zippers or snaps or things of that nature. Uh, and then once again, the very last process here is basically going through and, and packaging the products up. For down, generally, a plastic package might actually be just a little bit, uh, uh, might be a little bit constraining when it comes to moisture. Any type of product that's actually going to be adding on to the moisture and, uh, you know, moisture, heat, and time is going to make this any type of a product particularly fragrant. <laughs> it might be a little bit strong in order when it actually arrives in, in, in final retail. So sometimes different people are actually a little bit more worried about the amount of moisture that's going into the, the product how much you know what the percentage of moisture is in the in the actual materials, um, which is basically what you're seeing when the all the products are actually on the water for you know anywhere from like 10 to 35 days. So here, what you can actually see is the the, the material being boxed up and shipped out onto into a, a truck, and that's actually taken to port. And then, as I just mentioned, that it'll be actually in a shipping container from anywhere from like five to 35 days. After this process, then it's going to be as soon as it arrives, then it can be you know taken out of the shipping containers. It's going to be inserted into a distribution or a warehouse where the material can actually going to go to different retail or online locations, and that's where the final purchase of the by the consumer is going to occur. And this is basically wraps up our uh, quick little story about down and feather materials. Now we're going to go into a little bit more of the field product quality. The filled product quality is composed, comprised of a few different types of attributes. I've classified these as according to, first off, with the material. Let's start off with the down. 
The down actually has a few different attributes. The first one of actually being the physical attributes, and this is actually comprised of the composition species and fill power. These three are directly interrelated. You change one, you change you change the composition of the fill power, you change the composition or the species, the fill power is going to change. Color has no correlation to basically anything. However, color is only at, you know, relevant towards uh, maybe bedding products or light colored apparel. The reason is is because if you actually have a very light colored shell, maybe a light yellow or red, and you have white down on the inside, and then you have maybe one dark feather, it's always going to be a little bit transparent and make, the, make sure that, and make it look or appear as though the jacket is just a little bit dirty. Generally, the white material is going to be a little bit more expensive, not because of quality attributes or the variation between the fill power or the or any other types of performance attributes, but just basically because the um, because the 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 white is going to be a little bit more expensive, just because the material is a little bit more in high demand for the um, for the bedding materials. Generally, most jackets, especially if there's no non-transparent shells, are always filled with gray material. The second attribute we actually have here is cleanliness, and this is comprised of your oxygen, turbidity, fat and oil, pH, dust and odor, and other chemical uh, requirements. Moving on to the shell or the fabric portion of the of the of the article, we have generally downproof and air perm are very two very interrelated things that are actually dictated by the thread count and the yarn size. It's basically how close or how how close the the material is actually woven, and also de determined upon the actual thickness of the or the, the the size of the yarn. There's a lot of other attributes as far as like color fastness to, to water, color fastness to uh, crocking, a lot of the other different types of chemical tests, and performance tests. You know, sometimes there's different films and different types of things that are actually put on top on uh, fabrics. But just in generally, uh, as far as actually feel one of the direct directly important things for a fabric materials, making sure that it actually is breathable and it's also going to maintain going to make the are going to be able to sufficiently may, uh, contain the uh, filling material. The very last thing is actually more towards the finished product. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can actually do according to de determining the, the design of the the design or the production. There's also performance factors whether you're actually looking for a very lofty pillow or a very warm jacket. There's also a, a lot of social compliance making sure that the material is coming from ethical sources and a lot of other attributes determined by the either by the product or by the particular consumer that you're uh, that you're targeting. As the, the finished material comes together, one of the main things that's actually very important is the net fill weight, making sure that the, the, the article is actually filled to appropriate portions. If it's actually, you know, like I mentioned before, if it's actually a 200 gram jacket, you want to be making sure that you're getting 200 grams, not two, you know, not 180 grams plus 20% uh, moisture. There's also the compression recovery. There's a lot of thermal different, a lot of thermal uh, types of tests that can be performed. And that, once again, those are actually kind of de dependent upon if it's actually apparel or if it is uh, bedding, bedding materials. So let's go through each one of these different tests just a little bit, starting off with first off with the composition. The first thing that you're going to see is that, that it's most important here is the composition. No, ma no matter where you are at in the, in the entire world, it is always important to actually have composition listed and this is one of the major attributes. Very similar to gold, as you can actually see, the price will actually increase as you actually increase the gold percentage. If you're looking at maybe like a 22 karat gold, that's a 91.67% uh, gold percentage. Same thing with gas, as you're looking at maybe like 85, 90, or 95% octane, there's a lot of different variations, and down is no different. I mean, generally, a 90-10 indicates 90% down and 10% feather and other materials. Um, You'll also see right here the diff This is these are old prices, <laughs> so don't uh, don't worry about this being um, don't worry about this being uh, current prices per uh, kilo of down. But these are these are some prices that basically show that as you actually increase from a sixty to a seventy five percent or maybe a ninety percent material, then your price is directly correlated to the down percent down percentage. The major components that you're looking at right here is basically you have a 90, you know, have down cluster, down fiber, waterfowl feathers, feather fiber, landfowl, landfowl fiber residue, and then last of all, you're broken and damaged. And you also have quill feathers in there sometimes too, but quill feathers are not allowed in most countries. And that's the, the definition of that it kind of varies just a little bit, whether it's actually six centimeters, eight centimeters, or 12 centimeters. It's also dependent upon other different types of attributes. But basically, this is what a general test report is going to be looking like. The way that this is actually performed, the composition is performed is basically the material, two grams of the material 
for the United States or four grams of material in the in Europe um, is going to be sampled and then each one of this material each piece of this material is going to be put in each one of these respective beakers um, they go through it piece by piece with a set of tweezers it's a very meticulous process that can take anywhere from two to eight hours to complete upon completion you will see something that looks kind of like this where in this might actually might be like a 70 or an 80 percent down material where you'll see the down material right here the down fiber it looks like very miniature pipe cleaners just one piece of the, off of the down cluster then you also see feathers and feathers are not always the big ones they can actually be little neck and head feathers all the way up until four maybe six maybe eight centimeters long but these little teeny feathers are always going to be a part of a down composition Little feather fiber is also kind of a, a single piece of fiber that's actually come up, fallen off of the feather. This generally looks like just basically like a, a little piece of human hair. Last of all, you can also see the chopped and damaged feather. And the chopped and damaged feathers, sometimes when they take like maybe like older feathers, bigger and longer feathers, and they grind them up together, um, or maybe just through the gen general processing, you can actually see where this chopped and damaged feather is originating from. You'll also see a whole bunch of, you'll also see the residue right here. Residue is just other, any other types of attributes that are not um, included in there. The very last one here is, is what's known as uh, landfowl. So landfowl might actually be just a small percentage, usually less than, depending upon the you know, Australian or Japanese standards are typically a little bit more strict, but most standards will allow maybe 1 to 2% of, of landfowl. Okay. Moving along to the next thing, as soon as this actually, each one of these materials has actually been protect, correctly um, and, and adequately separated and it's in each one of the different beakers, the beakers are going to be systematically dumped out and they're going to be weighed. Each one of the weights are then converted into percentages, as you can actually see right here. This shows like the type of scale that is actually used inside of the industry, as well as like a quick little a screenshot of our database that actually goes through and calculates the percentages for us. Um, on a final report, you will see right here that the composition is actually going through um, each one of these different percentages, and it'll break that down. So if this is actually a white goose down 80% material, you will see that it actually passes the, the requirement as this is an 82.8%. So in the American standard, you have to have 80% or above. 79.9 is just not quite enough. 80.0 80 is, is adequate. Anything above 80.0 is going to meet the standard. And each one of the different other different components is also listed out right here. You can also find each one of the different requirements for each one of the different countries on IDFL.com. This right here basically shows a side-by-side -side comparison of what is, um, what is actually required throughout the industry. You can see right here that maybe a 90 on the far left you will see the blue column. The blue column indicates what is actually listed on the actual label of the product. Maybe uh, the law label either like on the inside of the jacket, maybe in the back of the jacket, or on all bedding materials you are actually required to write the composition percentage. So right here you can actually see that in the Australia for a 90-10, 90% is actually required. Canadian standard, this is in the process of being updated, but it's currently one of the lowest standards in the world where it's actually only required 75% of a 90%, which is 67.5. China, Europe, Japan, all the rest of the countries are all very similar as far as what there is, what there is required. But once again, there is a zero tolerance for most of these standards, so you must actually meet the 67.5 or above or the 90% or above. And each one of the other components also has its, re its requirements, so it's very important to meet those requirements. Moving along to our next portion here, you will also see species. Species is the secondary, but this is actually the separation after the composition is, is the, this is the separation after the composition has been completed, then the, de the duck, then the down and the feathers are going to be separated into goose down and duck down, and then goose feathers and duck feathers. Um, you will also see right here that this is the two general species that we're working with. The species that we're actually always talking about is either goose or duck. We did chicken and landfowl is typically identified in throughout the composition process, although it could actually technically be considered a species. Uh, very similar to the composition, or excuse me, as you can see right here, the goose is generally just going to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit larger than the duck. So generally, the larger the bird, larger the bird, the larger the cluster, the larger the cluster, the higher the fill power, and the higher the fill power it means that you can actually have a warmer, lighter material. And that's actually the major, the major attribute there. As you can also see right here, as you actually increase with composition, the cost goes up. As you actually kind of go duck to goose, it's going to cost you more. Once again, it's because generally goose is going to have a larger cluster than your duck. Okay. 
Um, right here, this actually kind of shows you the requirements for each one of the different countries. In uh, you know most countries, it's basically a 90%. So if you actually indicate a 90% white goose down material, then 90% of your of your down and 90% of your feathers has to be originated from goose. So this test kind of goes through and actually identifies the material and where it is actually coming from. The way that this is actually identified is after, once again, after the composition has been completed, then we're going to have the down and the feathers completely separated. And then we're going to go, to go through in a process like this. You can see right here where we have a little microfish. It has a 70, uh, 70 um, magnification of 70. Uh, seven, and then you can go through and you're looking for specific little patterns. And these patterns are looking like this. You can see right here with this goose sample that you all have these smaller nodes, these small little triangles that are actually along the fiber. If these are all um, very, a little bit smaller, and you'll see these uh, nodes systematically throughout the throughout the actual fiber. Uh, with a duck sample, you're going to see the node is actually going to, going to be a little bit broader, more like a 90, 90 degree triangle, and it's going to be a lot larger. Not only that, you're going to see them in generally in in, in traces of three. You might see two, you might see four, but generally right about three. It's very obvious that duck, the duck samples are generally very obvious just for the fact that almost every single barbule will actually have uh, these nodes indicating on them. The very last one we actually see over here is landfowl. And then generally we're working with chicken, but sometimes we'll see turkey, sometimes we'll see pigeon. Uh, many different types of landfowl are out there, but generally what you're going to see is 99% is of the time you're going to see chicken. And that's basically what a chicken looks like right here. When we get finished with the process, and once again we're going to weigh the material and we're going to actually turn those weights into percentages, where you can actually see right here two different reports. The first one we actually have right here is a duck sample. And you will never, very rarely ever see any goose in a duck sample, unless maybe perhaps it's actually couche or recycled material, whereas maybe like a little bit of a little bit of uh, post-mixing, uh, post-consumer processes. But you're always, you know, in a goose sample because generally your goose is going to cost more than your duck. Once again, it's very similar to, you know, maybe adding gold to a, adding copper to a gold ring, calling it rose gold, or finding maybe something that's a little bit inferior to a superior product, maybe like uh, looking for um, chocolate diamonds or things of that nature, or maybe adding a little bit of the other different types of elements into your gas. So you're always going to see a little bit of duck added to the, to the goose material. So you can actually see on this second report that there is definitely 10%, and they've actually just gone just a little bit over with the duck feathers at 11%. This is a very close call, but it, in the very end, it actually ends up, uh, all of the averages and the percentages actually end up being just right on where it's 90% goose and 10% duck. So once again, you're generally not going to see um, goose added to duck and sold as duck. Uh, that would actually be like you know adding gold into a copper ring and then selling it as a as a as a gold, as a copper ring. It makes a lot more sense to add a little bit of copper, a little bit of the inferior product to the superior product as basically a way of actually saving cost, maybe offering a slightly cheaper product. So once again here you can actually see the, how the, the breakdown of the composition is broken down for in regard to the content and also the species percentages. You can see that the goose accounts for a 90%, however the goose down is actually going to be 80%, and then you also have the duck which is actually an equ er, equivalent for the 10% of the duck, and then you also have 80% um, of the duck material still has to be down. So you have these four different uh, separations. You have goose down, duck down, goose feather, and duck feather. Um, moving along, this is, uh, you know, once again, I already mentioned about the, the color. The color is not, you know, not, not really important. However, it is uh, regarding with certain products that are a little bit more transparent or like a white quilt. I mean, a white down on a white quilt is, is virtually, un, un, you know, invisible. But a very dark brown or a black feather on the, on the white quilt quilt is going to be a little bit un unsightly. Moving along to the next portion here, what we're going to see is the, the fill power. And the fill power, once again, is the major component. Sometimes people can get a little bit confused about what fill power is. So let me go through with the actual the definition right here. Fill power is a consistent weight of a, it's a volumetric measurement with a consistent weight. So basically how much, how much space the material can see, or how much space the material will use. As you can see right here, uh, the there's two, there's a, scale, a set of scales right here and there's actually this much down on one side and this much down on the other side. 
um, but both of them actually weigh the exact same amount. So when you're actually putting that into a jacket, I want a thicker, I want a thicker jacket, but I want it, I don't want it to weigh, um, I want it, don't want it to be super, super heavy. So this is actually generally really relevant towards um, mountaineers where you're going to be going to be in hiking Mount Everest, or if there is uh, backpackers where they want to actually going to get a very lofty material that has maximum compressibility. So generally what you're looking at here is basically the more the more volume, um, the more space the, the, the material actually holds, the more air it's going to hold close to your body, which actually means more insulation, which, going to be, which means going, you're going to have a warmer product, which is a superior product. Another illustration that you can actually see right here, actually in the, in the, in the direction that the um, fill power is actually measured in, you can actually see right here different chambers. All of these actually have the same, am the same amount of weight, but there's obviously different, uh, different, different amounts, it, the same amount, but different volumes that are actually kind of being fulfilled right there. And once again, this is actually, you're going to see a direct correlation as you actually move from a 70-30 to a 90-10, you're going to get more loft. If you actually move from a duck cluster, which is about this size, to a mother, mother goose cluster, which is this size, once again, your loft is going to go up. So once again, the composition, the species, you're going to have a direct correlation to your uh, fill power. Um, fill power is a, one of the major qualities of maybe outdoor gear. You can gen generally see right here, like on a jacket or maybe on the sleeve or something of that nature, or definitely on the tag, the fill power that is actually, kind of, that is actually in the, the, the product itself. And basically what this is actually doing, the interesting thing about down is that through the, each one of these different little hooks and nodes and these little different structures, the down is very efficient at actually holding uh, holding air pockets. Very similar to a wetsuit is actually very efficient at actually holding water close to your body. Down is also very efficient at holding air close to your body and keeping yourself warm. I always use the analogy of, a, of the down is very, or fill power is very much like hair. Um, all of those different uh, different amounts right here with this uh, Simpson analogy, you will see that there is, uh, you know, the higher the fill power, or the higher the, the, the more the volumetric amount, the higher is going, the better the material is going to be. Um, if you, for example, actually go through and, and you run a marathon, though, and, your hair, and you're wearing a hat, then your hair is going to be very condensed. When we receive down right here in our laboratory here at IDFL, um, a lot of the times the material is going to be compressed together and so we're going to go through and actually do what's called a conditioning process. The conditioning is general, there's, although there's multiple different methods throughout the world, uh, the general one that is actually used and most popular and produces the most accurate results is known as the steam fill power. Um, each one of the different uh, conditioning methods is always going to include a combination of heat, moisture, air circulation, movement, and time. When, this, when the down is actually arrived in the, in the laboratory, once again, it is very compressed and uh, we have to kind of condition that. If we actually put that directly into the fill power cylinder, our results would be very, very low or it would be very, a lot of variation. When we actually take the down, we actually put it in a little box like you can actually see right here on the far right of the, of the screen. Um, we take the down, we actually steam it, and then we dry it with a hair dryer. It's very much similar to like taking a shower. If you go hop in a shower after running a marathon, then you actually wash it. You have that air circulation. You have that moisture. You have the heat from the hot from the um, from the hot water, and you have the movement. And then you actually come out and you actually wash. Your, you know, you wipe your hair off. Then your hair is going to be a lot more frizzy. Same exact concept actually applies towards down products. So basically, what we actually do is we go through and actually condition these according to the process, and then we actually take this material after three days three days after the conditioning process and we put those into the uh, into the fill power cylinder. Once again here you'll see three different cylinders. Um, they're all slightly different but there's the same at the same time they're the exact same concept. So we condition them, we put them into a cylinder and then you get a variation of different results. Uh, generally a cubic inches per ounce was the old American method. Cubic, um, now it's cubic inches per 30 grams. Kind of a mixing of the metric and uh, the imperial method, imperial system there, but it's uh, it's it's what's used around the world. In Europe, they actually use cubic centimeters per gram, and then in certain places, they might actually use height per gram. So basically, maybe the height of the cylinder. So maybe like this is 10 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 30 millimeters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all of those are, you know, the the cylinder might be a little bit different, and the conditioning method. 
But as soon as you get into the final volumetric measurements, then those are completely convertible. But if you're using a combination of different conditioning methods and cylinders, then that's not accurate. But once again, this is just a process in order to identify the, the volumetric measurement. As you can see right here, this, uh, this is basically an attribute. Uh, as you can actually see, the increase of the composition actually kind of provides an increase of the fill power. If we actually take the very best and the very worst conditioning methods and compare them, you will see right here that the box conditioning provides a lot, uh, a lot, uh, slightly lower and a lot broader results. As I mentioned before, the black, the black, um, the black um, results right here is actually the steam, so it actually kind of gives you a little bit better results. Some people might say that this is actually inflated result, but in fact, the the uh, the steam is actually more accurate to what the material was actually measured at directly out of the factory, so it is a lot more accurate that way. As previously mentioned, generally the bigger the bird, uh, the bigger the cluster. The bigger the cluster, the higher the fill power. This is a dash of research right here that we actually have that shows that, that indicates this is particular uh, fact. Where right here you can actually see as the you go from like a 600 to a 700 to an 800 size cluster, you're going to get a higher and higher fill power. Bringing each one of these compo components together, the content, species, and fill power, this is actually a very key slide that actually indicates the correlation and connection between species, connection, and fill power. You can see that the goose is generally a little bit higher than the, than the duck, and then as you actually increase the percentage going from a 60% to a 95%, you're going to get a higher and higher fill power as well. Moving on to our next attribute of cleanliness, we want to actually start off here with um, the wet lab, what we always call the wet lab. Uh, the wet lab is basically we're, not, we're going to be using the down, but we're actually going to be testing some water to test the cleanliness. But the process that we're going to be using for oxygen and turbidity is we're going to be taking some water and some plumage. We're going to be mixing that together in this, uh, <clears throat> this jar that you actually seen right here on the screen. Then it's going to be shaken for about 30, 45, or 60 minutes, depending upon whether it's the European IDFB or the Japanese method. Then we're going to separate out the plumage from the water. Now we're actually using distilled water, so it is very, very clean, uh, very clean water. So any type of dirt that is actually introduced into the water is going to be a result of actually mixing with the down. So that as soon after we've actually uh, separated the down from what you can see right here, this little, uh, this little, uh, this little center um, funnel right here, uh, then we're going to go through and actually start doing the different tests. The first one we're going to do is what's known as the oxygen. You can see right here we're going to take a dash of sulfuric acid, potassium permanganate, and merge that together with the water from the uh, water from the from the down. We're going to put that together, and then we're going to put the sulfuric acid and the potassium permanganate in there to identify how much oxygen material is in the in the in the in the sample. Um, once again, this is an indicator of any types of uh, mold, bacteria, viruses, um, any types of bacteria that is actually on the face of the down. Uh, most countries will actually require a less than 10, uh, 10 um, units parts per million. And then uh, certain, you know, certain countries or certain labeling requirements will actually require less than 4.8. The less oxygen that you have, is the, more, the cleaner the material is going to be. So which actually indicates the less um, bacteria and microorganisms that you actually have on the face of the down. Moving along right here, this is basically a, this kind of shows you what, what are the possible results. As I mentioned before, all of, the, all of the tests throughout the IDFB requirements are always required to do be done two times. The reason is because down and feathers are actually very inconsistent. It's a natural product. It's like measuring um, you know, different, you know, it's a grayscale or maybe very much like, you know, judging, you know, height of trees. So you're going to get a, like a, every time it doesn't matter where you're at, you're always going to get a little bit of a bell curve. So that's why there's always two samples actually done and the average is always reported. Right here, you can actually see what the oxygen rating is and that basically how that actually, you know, how the averages uh, average out. Uh, but once again, oxygen is showing anything, any organic material on the face of the down. As I mentioned before, we're going to be using the exact same water, so I already, already went through this specific process with the oxygen, but we're also going to be using this exact same water to use with our what's known as our turbidity test. Our turbidity test right here, uh, this turbidity test is actually used in a, in a series of different industries. Anything from what you can actually see right here at this young lady, um, you know, measuring the amount of maybe... Um, 
um, sediment in a river or maybe in any types of manufacturing process that actually uses water, which is a lot. Um, and they want to actually see the clarity of the water is they're actually returning that either into the environment or is they're actually going to be seeing how clean the material is. In the down and feather industry, the turbidity is actually a visibility standard that is used to multiple industry, industries to show the transparency of the water. Um, the way that this is actually performed is the water that was actually just extracted from the down composition is going to be dumped into a little turbidity tube, uh, generally a glass tube like you can actually see right here. And then at the very bottom of that, there's going to be a little X. If you can see the X like you can see it right here, then that is sufficient. If you can't see it, and it's like this one here on the top, then you actually need to drop that until you can actually see it at least this good right here, this middle portion, or this second one to the left. If you can't see it, then you have to continually drop the water. Maybe you start off at 1,000, and maybe you drop it 100, and you can drop it from 900 to 800, and, and so on and so forth, until you can see the X. In most countries, you're going to require a 300 or above requ uh, requirement is going to be uh, necessary in order to pass the, the labeling uh, requirements. Uh, because this method can be a little bit um, a little bit subjective depending upon maybe the person's vision or maybe like the natural light inside of the laboratory or other different types of attributes, a secondary method has actually been added onto this which is actually known as the NTU meter. The NTU is, stands for uh, Neo something turbidity unit. But this unit is basically going to go through and it's going to, as you can see right here, this water is going to be dumped into these, uh, these jars right here and these jars are going to be inserted into the NTU meter. Then the, the cap is closed right here and then you're going to be using a deflected light technology where a little beam of light is going to be shot across the sample. Any type of particulate is going to deflect the light and it's going to be detected on the other side anything else is going to go directly through the sample and you have two different types of detectors in order to identify how much particular is actually in the in the material itself. So this is a way to substantiate maybe the slightly subjective uh, portion before of the uh, of the millimeter method. As you can see right here there you know here's a, cor a, a combination of the oxygen and turbidity and the cleanliness. Once again oxygen is going to be any type of uh, organic material Turbidity can be anything else, sand, dirt, anything else of that, that nature that can be actually be added on intentionally or maybe just as a natural result. The oxygen portion that you can see right here, as I mentioned, in, in some countries it's actually going to be less than 20 oxygen. In most developed countries it's going to be less than 10. And, but a 4.8, a very clean oxygen is also going to help you avoid any type of order issues. Uh, for a turbidity, the minimum requirement is going to be about 300. Um, but 500 is a good standard and 1,000 is not uncommon. 1,000 actually once again helps you av avoid any possible um, order issues. Which going on a quick little tangent here, the only three attributes that anybody's ever going to have a major concern with as far as a consumer is concerned is, is going to be dust, odor, and downproofness. If your down stinks or if you actually kind of go and pat your pillow at night and there's a big plume of, of dust, then you're going to have a, uh, you're naturally going to have a very unhappy customer. Um, if it smells when they actually kind of go bad down to sleep, once again, the, the proximity between the person's, the person's face and the, and the down is going to be very close. Generally, wh young white duck feathers are generally going to have a little bit of an order. But oxygen, a good oxygen and turbidity requirement is going to avoid most of those problems. Um, the other issue, like I mentioned, down, downproof. Anytime that you're actually wearing a black jacket with white feathers in it, and then you're wearing a black sweater underneath that, you take off the black jacket and you're covered in white feathers, it's going to be very unsightly and, a lot, and going to result in a lot of returns. So those are three attributes that are not necessarily requirements of, as far as compliance for labeling, but are definitely um, important attributes for a consumer. Um, to show you the oxygen and turbidity and maybe even a couple of other results you can actually see right here. Um, you'll also notice here the fat and oil, which is not part of this presentation. But the fat and oil, very similar to, very similar to um, lanolin on wool. Down and feathers have a natural element, a soluble matter that's known as fat and oil. Generally, you're going to, you know, maybe a duck can have anywhere from 5 to 15% uh, fat and oil on it, which is what makes it very light and it makes it causes it to float in the water. Um, generally you're looking after processing about 1% of fat and oil. Uh, pH once again is another attribute that um, is important towards down and feather quality but uh, generally as a result of the 
of the washing process. If they wash it too, too strenuously with maybe the wrong detergent or wrong percentages, then you're also going to see a little bit of a high or a low pH. This is not necessarily required um, in most countries, but it is in some countries. But uh, just because it's not going to be touching the skin, it's not necessarily directly relevant. However, anything too high or too low for your pH is still going to cause a little bit of an itch when it kind of comes to the um, comes to the finished product. So a good, you know, down is naturally a seven pH, and it's good to actually kind of keep it right about there. Uh, last of all, you here you actually see the moisture. The moisture is basically, like any agriculture product, rice, wheat, grain, or anything else of that nature, is always going to, as soon as it's cut, maybe it might have you know 10 to 80% moisture in it after it's actually been dried out, then it shrinks. It's known as shrink in the agricultural industry. Down and feathers are no different. So basically what you're going to be doing is if you're actually going to be buying a 1,000 kilos of down, but it actually has 10% moisture, you're only buying uh, you know 90% of that. So you always want to be checking the moisture. Um, as I mentioned before, moisture is another attribute that actually adds to uh, odor when you're looking at products that are being um, shipped in and out of different countries. Uh, to kind of, kind of conclude this uh, presentation, I've also mentioned previously that some of the other different types of attributes that are actually included as part of, of quality assurance. Sometimes your social compliance and uh, other attributes, maybe sometimes your, your chemical, the cleanliness of your chemical is also going to contribute towards uh, towards a good product. Recently we've actually been doing a lot of testing with APEOs, OPOs, NPOs, which are basically the same thing. And then you also have formaldehyde and a few other different types of chemicals that are sometimes actually introduced as part of the uh, introduced as part of the, the the washing cleansing process or maybe through different types of uh, maybe an, you know anti-odor um, uh, chemicals or maybe odor, uh, odor decreasing uh, chemicals, or a lot of other maybe water, you know, a lot of other different types of chemicals that can actually be added uh, to the supply chain in order to enhance or make the material more effective. But that basically wraps up our presentation today. Once again, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope that we can actually see you in the near future. Thanks a lot, and have yourself a great day.